Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim Work with L'Oreal TV and L'Oreal Radio. There were some quotes by uh, Pope Francis heading an article by the AP that was published on April 8, 2016. And the title of the article is Pope Francis says conscience, not dogma, must guide Catholics in family life. And Jacob, the first question I'd like you to respond to is that the Pope is quoted. He said the church must no longer sit in judgment and throw stones at those who fail to live up the gospel's ideals of marriage and family. Let's begin with the Pope himself. On a previous occasion, I warned of the following. Pope Francis made the following pronouncement publicly after becoming Pope. Now remember, as Archbishop of Buenos Aires in Argentina, he refused to even meet with the child and victims of Roman Catholic pedophilia perpetrated against children by the Roman Catholic clergy. He refused to even meet with them. He was a very much a part of this problem in his own country of clerical pedophilia and the molestation of children by priests and in some cases by nuns. He was party to it, not actually doing it himself, there's no evidence, but certainly the church's mishandling of it, he was party to it before becoming Pope. He's not a man with a lot of moral credibility to begin with. Now, after becoming Pope, he said, the two homosexuals, the two men, are in a same-sex relationship, who is he to judge? Well, the issue is not who is he to judge. The Word of God is already judged. In Romans chapter 1 and in the Torah, homosexuality is unnatural and in God's, God's eyes, a perversion. It doesn't matter who was he to judge. If he was truly a man of God, which he most decidedly is not, he would say, God has judged. This is, again, emblematic of the Antichrist spirit that controls Roman Catholicism. Remember, it is the Holy Spirit who is the true victor of Christ. But every pope takes the title Vicarius Christus from Latin, the vicar of Christ. If you were to translate Vicarius Christus from Latin into Greek, it would be Antichristos, Antichrist, which means not only against Christ, but in place of Christ, the vicar of Christ, the one who is Vicarius in the place of Christ. He puts himself in the place of the Holy Spirit, who is the true vicar of Christ. He makes himself another Christ. This is every pope. Well, this pope is no different. Who am I to judge? God has already judged. That was his first error. The second error is this. It was political bubble talk. Jesus did not engage in political bubble talk. The Pharisees and Sanhedrin of his day had their own political bubble talk, which still exists in halakhic Judaism to this day. It's called Philpol. But when Jesus finished the Sermon on the Mount, we see something. Jesus said something that astounded the people. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 7. Verse 28. The result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. We have a joke that says if you have two Jews, you have three opinions. The Sanhedrin were very much Bill Clinton type theologians. I did not have sex with that woman. Well, <laughs> oral sex did not necessarily mean ordinary sex. This is what they get into legal argumentation, legalistic argumentation. What Jesus always did was. He interpreted the letter in light of the Spirit. The Spirit of the law, of the Torah said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. If you even desire to have sexual relations with, with, with the wife of another, as far as God's concerned, you've done it. 
Jesus always interpreted the letter in light of the Spirit. It was the Pharisees who played legalistic games with it. It could be this, it could be that. Whoever had the best lawyer could get around the law. And it's still like that in hierarchy Judaism. Well, the Pope would have made an excellent member of the Sanhedrin. This idea of who am I to judge? That's not the point. God has judged. Who, who are any of us to judge anything? But once God has judged, that's it. What he's doing subtly is putting himself in place of the Lord by not declaring something wrong on the basis of God's word, by not pointing out that God said it's wrong. Now, he did it in such a way it was, again, in the Roman Catholic, he did with a billfold, political doublespeak. Um, he said it in such a way as homosexuals and liberals within the Roman Catholic Church would say, Oh, the Pope has changed the church's position. But then the conservatives of the Catholic Church, who are just as hypocritical as the liberals within the Roman Catholic Church, the conservative ones are just as hypocritical, will say, Oh, he really didn't officially change the church's dogma. <laughs> like any other politician, speaking it on two sides of his mouth at the same time, only as a $3 bill. That is Pope Francis. Now he goes on to say, it is conscience that must guide people, not the teachings of the church. First of all, that departs from what Roman Catholicism has always taught. That the Pope was the magisterium of the church. He would tell you what is right and what is wrong with the teachings of the church. So he's departing from Catholicism. Now, not that I care about that. I think it's a good thing to depart from Catholicism, except he's departing in a wrong direction. He's coming out of one era and just going into a worse one. Our conscience is superseded by the Word of God. Our conscience is superseded by the Word of God. If the Word of God says something is wrong, it's wrong. If the Word of God says something is right, it's right. If the Word of God is silent, then conscience comes into play. The leading of the Holy Spirit to the conscience of a believer comes into play only when the Word of God is silent. For instance, what kind of acts are acceptable conjugally or in marital intimacy? What acts are acceptable, which ones aren't? There are biblical principles, but there's no text telling you don't do this, don't do that. It's a matter of conscience as the Holy Spirit would lead and direct. Anything I've done in faith is sin, as we always read. Well, the Roman Catholic Church is guilty of two things. One, it became guilty of going beyond the Scripture. It would actually tell married couples to refrain from sex on certain days and all this kind of stuff with no biblical mandate for doing that, in honor of all souls or in honor of this or that or whatever. And at one point, they had it down to two days. This was their teaching. Now, he says, it's only a conscience we can't say anything. The Word of God is first and foremost. If somebody feels something in their conscience is right or wrong, but the Word of God says otherwise, the Word of God takes precedent and priority over their conscience. The heart is deceitful above all things. Oh, I can feel in my heart it's right. It doesn't matter what you feel in your heart. What does the Word of God say about something first and foremost? You measure what's in your heart against what God has put in His Word. That's the acid test. But now this Pope has moved away from it. What's really comical is the constitutional model of Roman Catholicism is something called sempre edem, always the same. Once they have a deep dating doctrine, as I said before, they can't change it. But this guy is skirting very close to the edge. In fact, he's contradicting things other Popes have said. So my question is this. What about all those Catholic people who, however ignorantly or foolishly, paid attention to the man-made doctrines of the papacy and the dictates of other popes before it. Um, the many gentes, uh, uh, the papal encyclical against birth control. Millions and millions and millions of Roman Catholics ignored it and practiced birth control. They didn't care what the Pope said, but some of them continued to practice it. People in South America were having babies that they couldn't 
many supporters they were simply because they were trying to follow the teachings of the priests that came from the Pope on opposing birth control. Babies were born, babies died of things like malnutrition and pediatric disease, the parents couldn't take care of them, high infant mortality. There were even cases of uh, mothers dying of, of, of obstetric disorders because of the teachings of the Roman Church. Well, let's understand this more acutely. Is this Pope now telling us that all of those people, all of those couples, those families in these Catholic countries who, again, however foolishly and ignorantly, paid attention to the Vatican, they were wrong? That they shouldn't have paid attention to the Popes in the past? Well, if that's the case, why should anybody pay attention to him? The point of the matter is, therefore, they shouldn't. The man should be ignored. Catholics need to go back to the Word of God, not listening to that hypocrite in the Vatican. The man is a double-talking hypocrite. That's what he is. It's all politics and public relations. It's all a scheme. He's making major changes, more radical than any pope in modern history. There have been certain popes who orchestrated major pivotal changes. Uh, Pius IX was one, John XXIII was another. Um, Pope Julius was another. During the Council of Re uh, Reformation and the Council of Trent was another. Gregory the Great was the first. But now it's him. He's fundamentally redefining Roman Catholicism. Who cares? Let him redefine it. Roman Catholicism is not scripturally Christian anyway. Take the catechism and put a match to it. Take all of the papal encyclicals and do with them what you should do with Jehovah's Witnesses' watchtowers. Take the catechism, imprimatur, modern Oxford Roman Catholic catechism, and treat it the way you would treat the Book of Mormon or the Koran. A false word of God. A pseudo-logos. It's not from Jesus. Just stick to this. That's the truth. This Pope is a hypocrite among hypocrites. If what he's saying today is true, then the people who paid attention to his predecessors were wrong for doing so. Again, the question becomes, therefore, why should anybody pay any attention to him? Once again, they shouldn't. Uh, Jacob, the article goes on to uh, note, in a footnote, Francis cited his previous document the joy of the gospel in saying that confession should not be a torture chamber and that the Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect, but a powerful medicine and nourishment for the weak. First of all, the Roman Catholic concept of the Eucharist should not be confused with the biblical concept of the Lord's Supper that comes from Passover. Their concept of the Eucharist is that it is Jesus Christ incarnate by virtue of transubstantiation. So the concept of the Eucharist is itself not scriptural. That is not Jesus physically. We do not pray to it and worship it as Roman Catholicism teaches. Now there is something to say to the Lord's Supper ministering to the weak. That is the teaching of the New Testament. It ministers to us in our weakness. That is an aspect of the Lord's Supper. That is true. It comes or derives directly from the Jewish Passover in order to understand the Lord's Supper, and in order to have the strength and nourishment for the journey out of Egypt towards the Promised Land, crossing the Dead Sea, the Hebrews had to eat the Paschal meal. So, too, the Lord's Supper is something that ministers to us and, and helps prepare us and equip us in our weakness. There is that aspect, but that's the Lord's Supper. Don't confuse it with the Roman Catholic Eucharist. As for the so-called sacrament of penance, that whole thing is a ridiculous lie anyway. It doesn't matter what he says about it. The New Testament says, confess your sins to one another. No place in the New Testament do you see a regular confession being practiced. It was an ancient pagan practice that went back to the ancient Babylonian priesthood. We confess our sins to the Lord to be forgiven. Now let's understand this even further. Luther did not end well when he began writing. He learned from the French humanist scholar who knew Greek really well, Le Bivure, 
that the term metanoia in Greek meant to repent, not to do penance. Salvation came through <coughs> a repentant faith in Jesus, not the sacrament of penance, which the Roman Catholic Church had been telling people. Once that happened, Luther understood the whole thing of sacramental penance and sacramental salvation, an ex opere operato ritual even, like baptism, or the sacrament of penance, saving people, is ridiculous. That's not what metanoia means. It means to repent, not to do penance, or the sacrament of penance, as in confession. In Hebrew, the term is teshuvah, to turn from sin towards God, to turn. It has no relationship, either in Greek or Hebrew, to Roman Catholic sacramentalism. The whole thing is a lie. Don't worry about the confessional not being a torture chamber. The whole Roman Catholic system is a torture chamber. It is a footstool of Antichrist. No saved Christian should be part of it. And in ending with this article, um, women may appreciate this document, but Francis condemns, Pope Francis condemns at length the verbal, physical, and sexual violence many women endure in, in marriages, rejects sexual submission and the reprehensible practice of gen, uh, genital mutilation, and he says the belief that feminism is to blame for the crisis in families today is completely invalid. On the first point, this value to mention Islam is hypocritical and cowardly. It's obvious he's talking about Islam and the Islamic world and the status of women on the Sharia and in Islamic culture where clitorectomy takes place. But he doesn't even mention it. Again, it's all political with him. He doesn't even mention where that problem is coming from. Secondly, with the idea of the feminism, it is again not in harmony with what the Word of God teaches. This whole issue of female pastors and things, even among evangelicals, or these women who teach error running wild in the church and being allowed to do so, like Joyce Meyer. This is the feminism of the secular world creeping into the body of Christ. It doesn't matter what the Pope says, it matters what the Scripture says. Since the advent of feminism, something has happened. Feminism is like anything else. It may have begun good, but ends quite badly. Think of labor unions. They began as something good, but then they became a source of exploitation of the people they supposedly represent, labor racketeering back into it, and then it, it, unions became job killers. Unions began right. Public education, state educa state, state operated education began right. But with the hardest man in these people, it became something very bad. Very and John Dewey, it became something quite, quite bad. Well, feminism is the same. The lack of equal pay for equal jobs, that, that was an injustice. That's an injustice. Initially, they set out to correct certain things that needed to be corrected. I agree. However, when you look at what feminism has done, not to just the society, but what the women. By any statistical study of any credibility, violent crime has increased among women twice as fast as it has among men. Work-related stress disorders, cardiovascular, gynecological, neuropsychiatric, all of those things have increased dramatically among women since the age of feminism. What is it given women? Neuropsychiatric disease, higher gynecological, risk of gynecological disease, uh, female infertility, increasing, uh, what's it done for women? The stress and pressures that feminists have put on women. The feminist movement is sexist in itself, not simply in its attitude towards males, or its collective attitude towards males, but in its collective attitude towards women. Just look at it. As many women are pro-life as are pro-death, that is pro-abortion, just as many. But you've got this organization calling itself the National Organization of Women that imposes itself, that dictatorially tries to make itself the spokesman for all women, ignoring the fact that at least half the 
other women don't agree with it. I'm fundamental issues. The feminist movement is hypocritical and it stinks to hell because that's where it came from. Any ideals that happened in the early days of correcting certain social injustices which needed to be corrected has long been eclipsed by the damage it's done to society in general and to women in particular. This feminism has infiltrated the church. Now, I don't care about Roman Catholicism, it's a false church. But the idea should not be allowed to function as priests and all this stuff. Who cares? Who cares? Come out of her, my people. Saved Christians need to leave liberal Protestantism. They need to leave the Eastern Orthodox Church. And they need to leave the Roman Catholic Church. They need to get out. Thank you, Jacob.